by practice the protocol and principles of personal retreat. One thing about God that we must not miss is that He's a God who loves to be pursued. Proverbs 25 verse 2, the Bible says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, to conceal a matter. But the glory of kings is to search out a matter. So we are kings and priests. And so God loves to conceal things for us. Not really from us, but for us. Sometimes God also hides his face from us to provoke seeking. I'm trying to say that he intentionally creates situations in our lives that will propel us to seek more. Father, we thank you this morning. We give you praise. Thank you for your word. Your word does not fail. Help us. Have mercy on us. Help us to relate to your word. Relate to what you say to us. And give us the grace and the faith to stand and to move and act on your word. Even as your word is coming, we pray that your hand will be upon us for good. Let your loving kindness shine upon us. Help us to open our hearts to receive your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, we thank God for today. And you are all welcome to church this morning. I said you are welcome. Okay. Today is 1st March 2020. And uh, by the grace of God, we've seen the third man. Amen. And uh, we are happy to have seen the third man. And we are going to see all the other months, even to the end of the year. Amen. Amen. We've been looking at transacting business with God. And uh, today looks like the sixth part and the final part. And uh, um, today um, we are on the the, you know, we, are, we talked about seven principles that we should, be, we should know and live by if we are serious with uh, transacting business with God. We talked about the principle of worship, principle of brokenness, principle of consistency, principle of committal, principle of death, death, principle of seasons and times. And the principle of separation, which is the last one. So today I'm talking about the practice, the protocol, and principles of personal retreat. And that falls under the principle of separation, which actually is one of the principles that we must understand if we want to transact business with God. If we want to uh, go far in our work with God and to experience all of God's best. Uh, we need to understand the God that we are serving or the God that we are dealing with, his nature, and the things that we, we can do to help us uh, work with him effectively, get the results that are intended for us. And so, um, I want us to understand that. Now, we, one thing about God that we must not miss is that He's a God who loves to be pursued. He enjoys being pursued. That is God. And He loves to be sought out for. You know. And so sometimes He intentionally hides things for us. Not from us, but for us. So that we can and back on the search, we can we can pursue. Uh, Proverbs twenty five verse two. The Bible says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. So we are kings and priests, and so God loves to conceal things for us. Not really from us, but for us. In other words, what you are looking for is not lost. It has just been concealed for you. 
Saul's father's donkeys were not lost, were they? But he was searching for them relentlessly, and then he found a kingdom. So God concealed, hid the donkey so that he could find a kingdom. Sometimes God also hides his face from us to provoke seeking. And when I say he hides his face from us, uh, I'm not trying to say that he, he becomes hostile. No, I'm trying to say that he intentionally creates situations in our lives that will propel us to seek him more. Seek him more. That is why before you get to any next level of your Christian life, hunger is created. It is the hunger in your heart that will invoke. Hunger invokes encounters. Because the hunger will drive you into pursuit. And as you begin to pursue him more, you begin to have encounters. When I say encounters, I'm not talking about seeing God. I'm talking about having a spiritual accident, you know, a spiritual collision, you know, like colliding with something spiritual for your life to be changed. And in Isaiah 8 verse 17, the Lord was talking, talking about the people of Israel and he said that he is, I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him. He hides his face from the house of Jacob. He said, I will wait on the Lord. Why, why will he wait on him? Because he's not really seen. You know, seemingly, he has hidden his face from them. But what he did was that he created that situation so that he will, he will be pursued. So sometimes what God does is that God gives us a fortress. All the goodies of God. He will let you taste them, not eat them. You, you have to taste. And uh, when he gives you a foretaste, he withdraws to provoke a pursuit that will lead to you having the full taste. You remember I've been saying that God gives foretaste, and then later then we have the full taste. But when he gives the foretaste, it is to woo you and to get you running after him. Usually, in the work with God, when God begins to anoint you for service, what happens is that you begin to see many things. Sometimes, if it's, if it's in the area of the prophetic, you begin to be having dreams and visions and all that. And your dreams and visions are accurate. You see things accurately. Then it gets to a point where your dreams and visions become blurred. Then sometimes, it is as if you have lost touch and you don't see anymore. You don't see anymore. You don't hear as much as you heard. It is not that you are sinned. It is not because you are backsliding. Most of the time, it is the doing of God. He creates a holy dissatisfaction. He creates a temporary, a, a, a temporary stage of barrenness, dryness, to provoke a pursuit for higher realms and higher levels. It's, it's, it's all the work of God. Because the proof of desire is in pursuit. And I said all the good, all the things of God, we, we taste them. So Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 and 5 talks about people who have tasted the good word of the Lord. And who have tasted of the heavenly gift. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 and 5. People who have tasted the good word of the Lord and who have tasted the heavenly gift, not who have eaten, who have tasted. He said, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. How were they enlightened? They, they, they tasted the heavenly gift, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ, the heavenly gift, and they have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now, they have tasted the good word of the Lord and the powers of the age to come. We taste them. When you taste them, if it is the area of power, when you are anointed uh, with power, you begin to see certain things. Sometimes, th so the things that you will see, uh, that's why sometimes pride immediately sets in when God anoints somebody. If the person doesn't have the structure, in, the structure of teaching that will help the person to be balanced, the person becomes arrogant because he thinks that I've gotten there. He does not know that it is just a fortress. So it's just a matter of time 
you will see that the thing doesn't happen the way you want it to happen. The, you, went, you went for this meeting and you, you, you just invited the Holy Spirit and people were falling and people were screaming and you know there was deliverance and all that. Then you were excited. But then it, it gets to a point if as you walk with God, you see that now you are, you, you are still fasting and praying, still diligent with everything, but then you realize that now things don't move as they used to move. It's not because you have sinned. It's because God is drawing you. He likes to draw us, you know, because if you don't pursue him, there are certain things about him that you will not, you will not get. You know, so all these things are baits. They are baits, like you're giving a uh, bait to a fish so that you can catch it. And the, the are ways that God, God uses to draw us. So when you, when God, for instance, when when God puts fire in you, when God is trying to get your attention, He can use many things, many things to get your attention. He can use many lovely things to get your attention. Then when He gets your attention, that He puts His fire in you, then He starts running, and then you start pursuing. You start chasing. He starts running. He enjoys that. That that's how he works. So the fire is supposed to be burning. You can't sit still, and then you start pursuing him. Before he was pursuing you, and he was using all kinds of things, answered prayer, everything you know, just to bring you to a place where you will see that he's a good God. Then when you come, he puts his fire, his seed in you. Then. Because he has put his seed and his fire in you, you cannot sit still. Then you are pursuing the kingdom and pursuing him. So in First Peter 2, 3, it says that um, uh, we should taste. If you have tasted, the Lord is gracious. If you have tasted his graciousness. And when you read Psalm 34, verse 8, it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Okay, so holy discontentment or dryness is the motivation for seeking God which births new levels in the Lord. The second thing is that God wants us to be seekers. Not seekers, not people who uh, spend special times with God only, but he wants us to be seekers for life. People whose persons, whose inclinations are towards him. That we always want to move with him, always want to get to the next level with him. And so we are become seekers, we are become people who are seekers. When we say somebody is a seeker, somebody is a researcher, researcher, he's, he researches. Not that he's, he's, a, he's somebody who researches at a special time. No, that is your duty, that is your makeup. So we must seek him daily, build a relationship with him. Now, it is, it is, it is better to have a daily relationship with God than to have occasional retreats. It is better to have a daily relationship with God than to have occasional retreats. So the retreats I'm going to talk about is not to take the place of daily relationship with God. No. Both are important, but it is better to have a daily ongoing relationship with God than occasional retreats. Because he wants us to be seekers. But when you read Isaiah 6, 26, verse 9, let's read Isaiah 26. There are many scriptures we're going to be reading. Uh, it says, With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. It said, By my spirit within me, I will seek you early. I will seek you early. We're talking about seeking God early in your life and seeking God early in the day. So I will seek you early. Become a seeker. Uh, somebody who seeks God. Uh, the, uh, David said in Psalm 63, verse 1, he said, early will I seek you. He says, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul tests for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Early will I seek you. Psalm 24, verse 6. 24, verse 6. It says that this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, seller. This is the generation of those who seek him, 
those who seek his face. And he says, that is Jacob. Now, he's talking about a holy discontentment that will, that will provoke somebody to seek God for the person to break into newer dimensions of him or newer versions of him. Like, the reason why I mentioned Jacob was that Jacob was somebody who had to break into Israel. But that was not going to come till Jacob sought the Lord, actually had an encounter, I mean, face to face, or if you like, wrestling with a man, an angel, and the Lord himself. And so he broke into the new version of him, which was Israel. So the Israel of Jacob was already there, but he had to, there was an interface, you know, and he had to uh, seek. That's why I say the generation of those who seek him, they, they come to Genesis 33. Some of you, uh, I see if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Genesis 33, verse 24. Let me, yes. Um, and he put the maid servants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, Rahel and Joseph. He was going to meet Esau. Okay, then what happened? Um, are you in 24? 24. Genesis 32, 24. 32, 24. Okay. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. He was left. That's why I say the principle of separation. Uh, intimacy cannot be possible if there is no separation. Okay. So he was left alone. He was alone. When, when God encountered him, he was alone. Intimacy is always done, you know, in separation. Separation. That's why I say the generation of those who seek God, they are the generation of Jacob. The Jacob generation that breaks into Israel are the people who are alone, who are separated, who make the pursuit. There's a pursuit that they make, and that leads them to the next level. God always does that. If you, you can stay with God for a long time and never move on, you know, sometimes God will create certain situations that will make you seek him. And as you are seeking him, then you are breaking to a new version. Uh, I know somebody who was looking for the fruit of the womb. And she was praying and spending time praying and praying and praying and praying. And God birthed a ministry out of her before she had a answer you know so god created a situation that will enable her to seek him so that she will break into the next level some of the things that we call evil or we call bad things some of them are not bad the end is glorious some of them they drive people to the secret place for them to spend time with god and they are not their mind is not on spending time with god per se they are just going there because of their issues. But they end up, you know, they end up breaking into another, a newer form of themselves. So, while special retreats are major seeking moments, we, we, we must not become people of special retreats only. We must become seekers. Seekers seeking daily. If you have a friend who is only uh, loving, loving on special occasions and a friend who loves at all times. Which one do you prefer? At all times. You have a husband who will treat you anyhow, speak to you anyhow, and then when it is Valentine, he will buy a gift for you or take you out than somebody who is with you and every day is caring and kind. Which one do you want? Every day. Not once in a while. That is what God, that is why God wants us to be seekers, not just people who have special times. But special times are also very important because special times are Kairos moments. Kairos moment. They are special moments where we sense the need to turn aside, to spend more time with God. That is a retreat. So a retreat is when there's a, there's a special moment where you turn aside to God. You know, like um, when we go for, when we go, when we are playing football, we have halftime. When there's halftime, we retreat. 
go back to our coach and then we go back to re-strategize to get new strategies or to have a pep talk when they are when they are boxing uh, at the end of every round you retreat to your corner then your trainer and your coach will come and 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 inspire you inspire you you know to go for the next round that's a retreat so as we go along there are times where god will say hey stop come let me feel you then you go go back so we we retreats are not limited to even ministry or to christian living even companies and other other i know establishment they have retreats where you go for a refresher course you go for you to have uh, a rehash of all that you've been doing. You take a break so that you can reflect. That's retreat. It's the same principle that we apply, just that the things we do are different. So when is it time for a retreat? The first one is when God is calling you to turn aside or come up here. And God calls us to turn aside and he calls us onto higher levels of intimacy and destiny by releasing burdens into our hearts. And God will place the burden on your heart. And you will sense a tagging, that God is tagging you. You will sense a pull, that God is pulling you into special times, extended periods, special moments, sometimes of prayer and fasting, sometimes of waiting, sometimes of carrying out a particular thing, activity or the other, God can come to you and place a burden on you that for these two weeks, I want you to pray during the night. It's not the normal thing you do. Maybe your prayer, normal prayer time is in the mornings. But you can have a special burden, a burden that I have to spend two weeks. So these two weeks, I'm going to be praying every day, every day to cross over, every day midnight. From midnight to two, from midnight to three, midnight to what? I mean, all this particular time of the day is an impression. And there is always a reason for that. And we must, we must, we must, we must get to a point where God can speak to your heart and say, do this, do that. Not when you say retreat, we're not just talking about going to a place, you know, to spend extended, you know, days or long days. 40 days. All those are part of it. But I'm trying to say that it's not limited to that. God can tell you that for seven days, this seven days, do this special activity, spiritual activity. And by obeying God, something you will go to another level. So there are special moments where we feel the edge to get particularly intimate with God. When God wants, because you see, God cannot do anything in your life if uh, He does not work on your heart. You see, so sometimes He He moves your the desires of your heart, and you sense that I must spend some more time with God. I really need to be filled. I really need to hear from God. Something like that. Now, Exodus three verse three to four. Exodus three verse three to four. Um, then Moses said, "I will now turn aside and see these great sights." Why the bush does not bear? Moses was uh, tending his father in law's sheep. Then he got to the Mount, the Mount of Horeb. Then he saw a sight. I mean, he saw something. The, the tree was on fire, but it was not being consumed. And then he said that I will turn aside and see this great sight. Uh, why the bush does not bear? Because the bush must burn. If, the, if it is real fire, then the bush must burn. That was an angel that was, uh, God used an angel to attract Moses. The fire was not God because God is the consuming fire. But it, it, it had to be an angel that was doing that. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses. Now, God did not call him so he saw that he turned aside to look. That's the retreat. He turned aside to look. Turn aside to listen. Turn aside to look. See, looking is different from seeing. He saw it, but he decided to look. He decided to focus more. That was when God spoke to him. Hello. So, this type of retreat is a destiny retreat. It's like 
you are servicing the burden of the Lord. The burden that God put in your heart, you are servicing it. You are attending to the burden. And you, 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 you break into various degrees of your, of, I mean, various levels of your Christian life if you always attend to burdens that God, God gives you. Because God will always lead you by burdens. When I talk about the informative system of the believer, you will see that one of the major ways is by God manipulating your heart, you know, touching your heart. That's one of the ways he leads you. He manipulates your heart. That's what. That's when you have worked with God and you don't have idols in your heart. He can turn your heart. When your heart turns, especially in the area of spiritual activity, you will see God turning your heart and God is speaking to you. Then also, when you want clarity on certain major destiny matters, you must turn aside. You want clarity. You want to take a decision, a major decision of destiny. You don't just limit it to your normal prayers. You can turn aside, spend some more time and pray into it. And in the Bible, you see instances when you are about to take a decision, come to Luke 6, verse 12 and 13. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray. That's Jesus. And continued all night in prayer to God. This is where we got all night from. He continued all night in prayer to God. Why? Because when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. Look at Jesus Christ. There were many people following him who were disciples. Now he was going to choose 12 out of the many people, out of the multitude. And these 12 must be the apostles, those that he will send, those that will come closer to him, and then he will send them to go out and preach. And because he was about to choose the 12, he spent, he spent all night praying. The Son of God, when he was man, he did not rely on his own understanding. He spent all night praying because he had to choose 12 people. And the 12 should include Judas. I hope you know that. Because it was written that the one who dip his, his bread in his soup stew will betray him. And he knew that. And so he had to choose somebody who would do that. And in order, to, in order not to miss Judas, he had to spend 12, I mean, all night praying that he would not miss Judas. <laughs> when you have come to a destiny moment, so this, this, this one is that you, are, you want to take a decision. You don't just sit down and say, Father, what do I do? No, it's time to turn aside. Be, I'm talking about major destiny decisions. Where should I be? What should I do? With whom? Are you getting me? Even marriage can come under it. Because maybe God has called you to do a particular thing. Lord, who is my partner? Maybe you are a woman. God has called you to do something. Lord, who is going to be my leader? You are a man. Who is going to be my follower? And my help and my partner? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's destiny related. Are you getting me? It's destiny related. And all, let's say, should I come to full-time ministry where I don't do any work? Or should I, should I do what? You don't, you don't just sit down and say, Father, I pray, show me. No. You have to turn aside. You have to turn aside. You, God will give you the prompting, but you have to service the prompting of the burden and turn aside. Spend some time and then pray. Jesus spent time to pray because he wanted to make a choice. Number two, when you have come to a destiny moment in your life, a destiny moment in your life, you must also turn aside. Sometimes um, we have major moments in our lives when you are about to enter another decade of your life. You must turn aside, find out God's mind concerning this decade. Maybe a, sp a particular age uh, that you are about to hit which will make changes in your life. Ask God, what, what, is, what, what is your next agenda for me? Are you getting me? 
when Jesus Christ was 30, he went to be baptized. No, there are, some, there are certain ages that you know that uh, you will turn aside and, and, and pray. You know, or you can even make it a habit that before every birthday, you turn aside. Ask God, next year, what is your agenda for me? Or you pray, thank God. When you don't, you know, come to Daniel 9, verse 1 to 3. Daniel 9. Look at how Daniel also handled a destiny moment in his life. Therefore, the Lord, no, 1 to 3. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he will accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So Daniel set his face to seek God for 21 days to understand what to do because the time for the prophecy had come. This prophecy was given by Jeremiah and Jeremiah said that 70 years God will do this. But when the time drew near, Daniel began to seek the face of God. He turned aside. That is a time to turn aside because God says this year, I'm going to do this. Now, so when the year is approaching, that you turn aside so that you receive wisdom how to, how to walk in that destiny moment. Because when Daniel turned aside, for 21 days, then the, the very first day he started making inquiries. God sent Gabriel, said, Go and give him the answer because of his heart. But then Gabriel was withstood by the, the, the prince of Persia for 20 days. You know, so for 21 days, the answer did not come. And Daniel was still praying and fasting. And, and God had despite the answer, but there was there was an opposition. Because the angel was coming to give Daniel light. And light is one of the articles of dominion in scripture. And so when you are receiving light, the enemy becomes nervous. And he will fight you tooth and nail when you are receiving light. When you are receiving healing, he, he does not mind. When you are receiving a breakthrough, he doesn't even mind. But light, because light will liberate many people. That light Daniel was about to receive will give him wisdom as to how the people of God will realize their destiny and the prophetic fulfillment of their destiny. And so the devil fought against it. Now, the, the third one is fourth one. When you don't understand what is going on, it's time to turn aside. You don't understand. Certain things beat your imagination, beat your understanding. It is written in the Bible that this, this, this. Why is this happening in my life? I don't understand. Let me inquire. This thing has never happened before. Why did it happen this time? I don't understand. Let me turn aside. Anytime you, something happens in your life or even it, at your workplace, in your ministry, whatever, and you, if you don't understand, you must turn aside and begin to see the face of God. Because sometimes you need to have keys that will end that thing. You know, that will end that thing. You need to have keys that will end that thing. So when you don't understand something, don't, don't sit down there. Go and, and ask God. Ask God. I remember in the year 2000, one of our workers died. It had never happened before. And after that, too, it has never happened before. At that time, I had not even started work. But then, I knew I was part of the company. And when it happened like that, I went for a retreat. I went for a retreat. And I began to ask the Lord, why this thing happened? Then I saw, I had a mental picture of somebody stealing gold. So I told them. Then when we made inquiries, we realized that there were three people. And they went to steal gold. And two of them had died. He was the last person. He just died. You know. It, I mean, he, he fell and then died. So, it, when I turned aside, then I received instruction. Then, 
I was given instruction as to what to do. What to do. The prayer to pray. To stop that thing. Because if, if the devil is chasing somebody and the person comes to your house, you are responsible for... The, there must be a covering. There must be a covering. So even if the person has done something, when the person comes to your, 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 your authority, your environment, you must know how to release covering and protection over the person. You know, David, David told um, one guy, he said that the one who is seeking your life is also seeking my life. But with me, you are safe. Once you are with me, you are safe. In Genesis 25 verse 22, Genesis 25, and you know, with this, I'm going to be giving you many personal experiences because I've, I've been doing this for so many years, you know, for so many years of seeking the Lord, going on special retreats, carrying out special instructions and all that. And I think you will benefit from my experience apart from what I'm teaching you. But the children, go to 20, 21. 21. Now Isaac pleaded with, his, with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together within her and she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. You see. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. Now this is this is the point where you can prophesy. You see, Rebecca inquired of the Lord and she was told. God explained to her what she was going through. It was not normal. I mean, she's a woman. She knows the normal kicking, you know, when babies are in your womb. But this one was abnormal. Otherwise, she wouldn't have gone to inquire of the Lord. This one was not a normal kicking. It was something strange. When she went, God told her that the younger shall serve the older. That was why Rebecca schemed to get Jacob to go for the birthright. I mean, she, she, she knew the mind of God concerning the two people that were in her womb. Why? She inquired. What about if she had not inquired? God would have done it anyway, but she wouldn't have known. Are you getting me? So, you see, Isaac loved Esau because of venison. Rebecca loved Jacob because of prophecy. And destiny because she knew she, she inquired, she turned aside, and God spoke to her. So, when something is happening, you don't understand, go to God. Second Corinthians 12 8, Paul, something was happening to Paul, he didn't understand, he, he, he didn't know that a messenger of Satan had been sent to him. He didn't know concerning this thing. I pleaded with the Lord three times that he might depart from me. Now, when he says, I pleaded. You know, um, other 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 versions will say, say I besought. You know, it's not like he just every day, one, three days, say three times. You know, three times I besought the Lord thrice. You know, so he, it was a time to turn aside because what was happening in his body, he didn't understand. Everything, everything was. I mean, Paul, the man of everything, but he didn't understand what was happening. He said, let me turn aside and make inquiries. And God said, don't worry, what you are experiencing. It's from the devil. It's a messenger of Satan who has been sent to buffet you. But I'm not going to take it away. I'm just going to give you grace to endure. Because my grace is sufficient in you. And my strength is made perfect in your weakness. When Paul got that explanation, immediately he changed his thinking about the thorn in his flesh. Then he said, therefore, most Gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, somebody was crying that, take it away from me. Now, he's saying, I will rather gladly boast about it and rejoice. Why? What change? Why the change? He turned aside. When you turn aside, God will speak to you. When you, the, the, the fifth or what? What? Fifth one. When you sense the need to withdraw and refuel, you will sense it. Ministering here and there depletes the anointing. And you must sometimes go for refueling. Even the apostles, 
on the day of Pentecost, they were filled. In Acts 2, 4, they were filled. They spoke in tongues. But in Acts chapter 4, they prayed again and they were filled again. So, one initial infilling, several repeated refillings. And you will know. See, so, Jesus Christ had that practice. It's not the normal prayers you pray every day. I mean, he had that practice of withdrawing. That practice of turning aside. Apart from the prayers he prayed every day, there were special times that he would withdraw himself. Times that he would hide himself. Times that he would go before the Father for extended periods. One of them was the all night that we saw. Come to Mark 135. Look at Jesus' um, daily routine. See, this is a daily routine, something he did every day. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place and then he prayed. Now this was a daily routine, something he did every day. Okay, uh, He would go out to a lonely place to pray every day, a place that is quiet to commune with the Father. And he usually loved to be on the mountains and in the gardens. Then come to Luke 5 16. Luke 5 16. Luke 5 16. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. That was Jesus. So you see the two parts, the two sides in Jesus' life. He will pray every morning, but then often he will. Re- he often he will withdraw into the wilderness. This one was not a daily thing. When he says often, he often withdrew into the wilderness. It meant that from time to time, occasionally, every now and then, he will withdraw into the wilderness and then he will pray. You remember the first time he was sent into the wilderness, he was sent there by the Holy Spirit. And the reason for that was also a retreat. He was not sent there to be tempted. He was sent there to, to be filled and to be empowered. It was after his engagement with God that the enemy came to tempt him. And that was permitted and allowed. But God did not send him there to go to be tempted. No. He sent him there to go to be prepared for ministry. Empowered for ministry. That was a special time of retreat. And he repeated that wilderness experience from time to time. He would often withdraw, go to the wilderness and build himself again. Or refuel and then come back for ministry. Even, look, even the son of God. Even the Son of God, he, he, he went on retreat. Jesus, Son of God, who had the Spirit without measure, the Son of God, who God anointed not only with the Holy Spirit, but also with power, he will go on retreat. He loved mountains and gardens. Come to um, Luke 22, verse 39. Luke 22, verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, and as, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. As he was accustomed means that as he it was his habit. So he would usually go to the Mount of Olives. He had special times, special moments, and special places where he prayed. Mountains and gardens. Look, John 18, verse 1 and 2. John 18, verse 1 and 2. John 18, verse 1 and 2. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Continue. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. That's why Jesus was able to track him. He knew that this, this man, this garden is where they meet. And when, when they will meet, you know, he will, he will go a stone through he, and then he will kneel down and pray. And he, he always had special moments, special times, special places. There's nothing wrong with having special place where you pray to God. There's nothing wrong. Even though God is not limited, you can pray anywhere, anywhere that is quiet, anywhere that you can hear God. You can pray in your room, in your car, anywhere. But there's also nothing wrong with having a special place where you will often go to spend time with God so that you will not be distracted. You can have that. So, it's very important. When you have special times of God, retreat. These are some of the blessings you receive. You have intensified pursuit of God. 
your pursuit of God is intensified. In other words, your love for God is deepened. You know, your soul, there's something that is done in your soul when you wait on God. Your soul is refreshed. Your soul is empowered. Your soul, the love of God is, you know, shared in your heart. It's deepened in your heart. A refreshed and renewal of weary spirits. When you see that you are becoming weary, you see sometimes you get to a point where you see that things are becoming, I mean, a, 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 a boredom. You know, like, it's like everything is boring. You know, you have been doing this, doing this. You are, you are stuck in a rat. You know, sort of, it's like uh, you are seeking for adventure. It's like you are, you are becoming so used to uh, routine that now things are just mundane. You are just going through the motions. It's time to turn aside. When you are, your zeal is vanishing, is depleting, your excitement goes down. It's like you don't even have, have a desire to even pray, desire to read the Bible. You no longer, you are no longer turned on by the Lord, turned on by His His His, his, his Word, His revelation. It's not a thing that you yearn for anymore. Your passion is going down. Your spirit is becoming weary. Sometimes the things we pick. As we go through life or we go through ministry, they have a way of dousing or they have a way of dampening our spirits, including people's issues that you pray for, people's burdens that you pick in the spirit. If you are an intercessor, you need retreats very often in your life. Otherwise, it will get to a point where you will see that you, you are creating problems for yourself. Yes. Because you carry people's burdens on your heart, you know, and you are always ministering to people, ministering to people, minister, always giving out, giving out, giving out. So there are special moments that we must go and then also receive. Even though and in those moments you still intercede, but because you are in the presence of God and having special time with Him, that time it is rather refreshing you, not draining you. There are times when ministry drains you. There are times when ministry refreshes you. When you are in the glory, you are refreshed. When you are not, you are drained. You see that virtue can go out of you. Virtue. So if you are somebody who is an itinerant preacher, moving from place to place to preach, today you are here, tomorrow you are there. See, before you can maintain that um, effective itinerant ministry, you must also have a solid and effective retreat um, uh, shadows. Otherwise, you experience what we call burnout. There are people who get to place in their ministry and they simply experience burnout. They just collapse. Not physically, but spiritually. They just lose strength instantly. But it's not instant, but it happens instantly. But it's a, a it's, it's a gathering, you know, like a culmination into that thing. Why? Because you are just on the go, giving, 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 giving. No time for God. So you can actually leave God to do ministry. Like when the Lord said that, He said, "Many people have left me to do ministry." He said, "Don't leave me to do ministry," and I was surprised. Say, how do people leave God to do ministry? Say, very simple. If you don't have the discipline to maintain or to shadow times with God, you will be you you can easily become people's minister, and God doesn't even know you anymore. Because there are times when you get to where you know God has given you the endorsement, He has endorsed you for a generation, and anytime you stand, anywhere you stand. You'll be a blessing. Okay. But it does not mean that the connection is intact. You have to maintain it. Maintain it. You also have a fine tuning of spiritual faculties. When you go for special retreat, there's a fine tuning of your faculties. Your spiritual faculties are fine tuned. They are worked on. So they are sharpened. They are sharpened. That's why you receive specific guidance for specific situations. 
when you embark on retreat. There's a crossing to new thresholds in God. Crossing over into new thresholds, new levels. Jesus Christ, it happened to Jesus Christ. Come to Luke 4, 1 to 2. Then after 1 to 2, we'll go to 14. Luke 4, 1 to 2. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, notice that it was not the devil who led him there. It was the Spirit who led him there. Not to be tested or tempted, but the wilderness is a place where you learn, you build capacity for the assignment. It's a place where you turn aside. The wilderness is where you learn intimacy, you learn warfare, you learn sacrifice, you know, that's where you, you they build the tabernacle, the, I mean, everything, you know, they learn how to fight wars. Then, go to verse 2. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when he had ended, he was hungry. So Jesus was fasting. He was, he was not eating food, but he was drinking water, not eating food. Only water that he was drinking. Now, then go to verse 14. When he came out, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. You see, the Son of God, he came as a Son of Man, and everything he did was an example to us, that as a man, as a human being, doing the work of God or living the Christian life, you need special times with God for refueling and refilling. Now, I'm going to give you a model how uh, we go about spending time in retreats. It's a model I'm giving you. It's not a formula. It's a model. It's not a formula because retreats should take the format the Holy Spirit takes per time. So, I'm not saying this is a formula, but it's a guide. At least, if you follow the guide, it will help you. And then, when the Holy Spirit wants to do a new thing, he can uh, interrupt it and then do something new, you know, every day. Because it's not all the time that you go. For instance, the, la the, the, the last retreat I went to, well, as soon as I got there, then the Holy Spirit said that pray, heal my misalignment, heal my backsliding. And I have, I've never prayed that prayer on a retreat before. Even though in most retreats, uh, I, I do consecration. I, 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 re I consecrate myself to the purpose of God, the will of God afresh. You know, I do that always on retreats. But I had never prayed this prayer, heal my misalignment, heal my backslidings. And the Holy Spirit just spoke to me on that first day of the retreat where I decided, I, I mean, after I had entered the room, I had uh, taken control over the room and all that. The very first thing he said, pray this. And I didn't know that there was misalignments to be healed and backslidings to be healed, you know. But then as I began to pray, then I realized that he was changing certain things in my heart to realign with him certain thinking, certain mindset, many things, many, many things. It's good to have time with God. It's very good. So I'm going to use the tabernacle of Moses as a model, as a format. And, you know, the tabernacle of Moses, I think I've taught a lot about the tabernacle of Moses. Okay, so um, we are familiar with the articles of the tabernacle of, Mo of Moses, the various pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. But um, I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, the tabernacle was made up of three parts. Three parts. The outer court, the holy place, and what? Holy of holies. Okay. So, the outer court had a gate. The first thing you saw was a gate. Because the gate was what you will pass, have to pass through before you enter the tabernacle. When you enter the tabernacle through the gate, the first thing you see is a very big altar. A very big altar. It was called the bronze altar or the brazen altar. 
and all manner of sacrifices, blood sacrifices had to take place here in the uh, on the brazen altar. So there was there was no animal sacrifice in the tabernacle again, apart from the one that took place at the bronze or the brazen altar. Then also, every form of fire that had to be used in the tabernacle had to be taken from that altar. Every fire. Every fire. You know, for instance, the fire that was used to burn incense in the holy place had to come from here. If you brought fire from your home, you'd be struck down. That was what Nadab and Abihu did. Sons of Aaron brought strange fire, which God had not commanded them. And then God killed them. Then, from the bronze altar, you go to the lava. L-A-V-E-R. The lava. A bowl that contained water. So, the, the, the priest, they will go and then they will wash their head, their feet, and their hands before they will enter the holy place. They have to wash their, their head, their hands, and their feet before entering. So that was what the lava stood for. The, the water was in that bowl, that basin. That was why Peter was telling Jesus Christ that, look, not only my feet, then wash my head and my hands also. When he said, if I don't wash your feet, you're not part of me. Then he said, oh, then wash my head and hands also. Then the holy place is the next, the next compartment. And the, there was a door here. So you enter through the door, come to the holy place. When you come to the holy place, on your right side, there's a golden candlestick. A golden candlestick. You know, it had seven branches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But one stand and seven candles on the candlestick. Only one stand, but it spread out into seven branches. Then on your left, there was a table of showbread. A table with 12 loaves of bread. You know, 12 loaves of bread. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So six on one side, six on the other side. And there were 12 loaves of bread on the table of showbread. Are you following? Okay. Then when you go forward, you will meet another altar. This altar is a golden altar of incense. Everything in the holy place was golden. Golden candlestick. Then the table of showbread was golden. And the golden altar of incense. This one was not the bronze altar, the, 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 altar, the golden altar. It was incense that was burnt there. Then you come to the last furniture. Of course, separating the holy place, holy of holies, was a thick curtain, you know. But then when the, you come to the last piece of furniture, which is the ark of the covenant, you know, with the cherubim standing there and the mercy seat in between the two cherubim. The two cherubim, they were standing on both ends of the ark and their wings had been sprouted like this. And between the two of them was a bull called the mercy seat. It was from that bull that God communicated with David at Moses. That bull called the mercy seat. That was the bull that received the blood. When the animal was killed in the outer court, the priest, high priest, would take the blood. He would change his attire and wash himself, you know, at the outer court. Then change his attire into a, a white linen garment. Then he will go to burn incense. When the incense arises, then he will enter the Holy, Holy of Holies. Then he will sprinkle the mercy seat with the blood for seven times. Then they will, the people of Israel will have atonement. Their sins will be covered, you know, waiting for the blood of Jesus to take away their sin. But this is, this is a picture I'm giving you. Now, in this place, you have alignment. In the, holy, in, the, in the outer court, you have alignment. Then, in the Holy of Holies, there's activity. Activity. Then, in the Holy of... I mean, in the Holy Place. Holy of Holies is where you have worship. You have worship. Now, so, when you enter 
the gate, you you must bring you must bring your spirit to a certain level, a certain wavelength of the Holy Spirit before you can commune and can come to a point of reception. Uh, you, you any time you want to receive from God, you don't want to. I mean, be on different wavelength with God. So the purpose of the alignment is to bring you, bring you on track, bring you on track so that you'll be on the same wavelength with God. So then at the alignment stage, you have the gate. The gate stands for thanksgiving, thanksgiving. So when you want to spend special time with God, you want to spend on a retreat, you don't just go there and say, you start speaking in tongues, you start, no. You must enter his, 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 his courts, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his court with praise. Thanksgiving and praise, they go together. In the Bible, you always see praise and thanksgiving together. Praise, thanksgiving. So Psalm 100, 100 verse 4, it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his court with praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his court with praise. Psalm 100 verse 4. Thanksgiving and praise. Thanksgiving and praise. Thanksgiving and praise. Thanksgiving and praise. So thanksgiving and praise, they go together. And that protocol must be observed to bring your heart into alignment with God. It must be observed. We usually gloss over thanksgiving. But it's very it's very powerful and very important to spend time thanking God. That's why See, when you say that uh, I, I can't I can't spend more time with God, you are lying. Because even thanksgiving alone, the things you can thank God for, there are many. Plenty. You can you can spend one hour thanking God. See, the reason why we don't go into that is because we don't write. So you can tabulate all the things you can thank God for, write them one after the other. You see, it, Intimacy with God is hard work. When I say hard work, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about relationship with God. So maintaining it, it takes discipline. It takes consistency. It takes a desire, sustained desire. You have to have something really pushing you to do it. Because even before you go for a retreat, I realized that it, it will take you about one week to prepare for the retreat. I mean, if you really want to go on retreat, even if the retreat is even one week, it will, it will take you one week before to start gathering all the things in your mind. You know, structuring your retreat plan, everything, including what I'm talking about, things to thank God for. Don't take anything for granted. Bible says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. And when you acknowledge him, then he will direct your path. When when he says in all your ways, it means that every little thing, every little thing, he must be acknowledged. In every little thing, he must be acknowledged. And you must give him thanks for things that you think are not even important. Because God is grieved when we become ungrateful. He's grieved. And you may, you may be complaining and may be murmuring, but he has done a lot for you that you have not even thanked him for. You see, people sometimes, we take God for granted. We think that because he's God, he doesn't have to be grieved because after all, he created us. So if he did this for us, why should we waste time or bother ourselves? He knows we are grateful. No, he doesn't know. I mean, when I say that, you know, you don't have to assume he knows. But he himself is grieved when we are, we are not grateful. So enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his court with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Second Chron- uh, Chronicles 31 verse 2. Chronicles 31 verse 2. Second Chronicles 31 verse 2. And Hezekiah appointed the divisions of the priests and the Levites according to the divisions, each man according to his service, the priests and Levites, for burnt offerings and peace offerings to serve 
to give thanks and to praise in the gates of the camp of the Lord. Give thanks and praise. Give thanks and praise. Second Samuel 22 verse 15. Second Samuel 22 verse 15. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. You see, thanks and praise. Thanks and praise. Psalm 35 verse 18. Psalm 35 verse 18. 35 verse 18. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. This was talking about corporate thanksgiving. This was talking about testimony. When we say testimony, testimony is also thanksgiving. So anytime you come and then you give a testimony, you are giving thanks in the great assembly and you are praising him among many people. But on your special moment with God too, you must also give thanks to him and mention the things. Then I come to uh, Ezra 3.11. Ezra 3.11. Ezra 3.11. Okay. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. See, they were giving thanks to God for he is good. For his good. We thank him for his goodness and we praise him for his greatness. We thank him for his goodness. We praise him for who he is. We thank him for what he has done and we praise him for who he is. We magnify his name. We tell him how great he is to us. Either through words or through songs. That's why even songs that you must, you must there are songs that you must select for your retreat. There are songs that you must select for your retreat. Yes. Because you are, you are planning to have a special time with him. Special time with God. So that's, that there are songs that you must select to help you. To help you have that special time with God. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> so Thanksgiving is acknowledging him and everything he has done. Everything he has done. Mention them one after the other, and you will see that by the time you finish mentioning them, you would have spent already spent one hour. Because the retreat time is a time that you're not rushing. That's why you must you must create that time and spend that time. You are not rushing. Anyway, it's it's time that you have dedicated to turn aside. So there's no rush. It's not it's not it's not like the morning time where you are you are in hurry to go for lectures. No. This time is a special time. No distraction. Nobody is going to call your phone because your phone is off. Yes. Nobody is going to uh, say do this because you have created that time. So you plan for it. Then the brazen altar. The brazen altar is a place of affirmation of identity. So it's like you're, you are coming. Oh, that's good. You are, you are coming. You are bringing your heart into alignment with God. So, the place where you will remind yourself of the finished work of Christ. Because remember that you are only able to approach God on the basis of the finished work of Christ. Not on your own terms. So, affirming your identity. Reaffirming your identity. That's what we mean by come boldly. When he says come boldly to the throne of grace, what he means is that come because of the identity, because of Jesus Christ. So as you come, you are coming in the name of Jesus upon the finished work of Christ. That's, what you, that's how, you, how you come. Boldly. When you read uh, Resolving Special Conflict, I took time to um, outline some of the ways you can affirm your identity. Okay, So you can refer to that book, you know, and then you can look at where I've written reaffirmation or affirmation of identity, where you... you you say things like, I'm a child of God. I've been washed by the blood of Jesus. I've been bought. I've, I've, I've been made to sit with him in heavenly places. I've been crucified with Christ. You know, I've been translated from the kingdom of darkness. When you say these things, you are, you are bringing your heart into alignment. You have not yet started. It's like you are just all these things, thanksgiving and all that. You are, you are bringing, bringing your heart. Is still in the place of alignment. 
bringing your heart into alignment with God. Hello? Yes. We don't have to rush God. No, take your time. Have time for him. You see, that's, 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 that's how it is. And when you do it like that, you see that when you get to a certain point, you will see that you have created the atmosphere. We, we create atmospheres to engage God. It's not half as that. It's not that you don't just engage God because you are there, there to pray. No. You have to create the atmosphere. The reason why you, we sing songs and all that is to create an atmosphere to engage Him. Because you cannot assess Him just anyhow. No. See, the fact that we say we, sh- we should come boldly doesn't mean that there are no protocols to follow. You don't just come boldly. Come boldly how? You approach him. You approach that there are protocols to... Have. See, that's why I said we must... For instance, um, uh, when, when, you are, when you are going to a king, doesn't matter whether he's your father, there are protocols to observe. And the protocol is to bring your heart into alignment. Because what you are... The realm you are getting to is around the spirit. And your spirit man is within your body. Your spirit must come into alignment with the Holy Spirit for you to be able to assess the things of God. Because the things of God, they are always in the spirit. In fact, even the blessings of God, he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Spiritual blessings. And they are located, they are in the spirit realm. You want to hear from God. God is a spirit. And so you must bring your heart in alignment. And I'm showing you how you can realign with God. So if it is a petition retreat, you are, you are, you are going to present a petition to God. Now you have not even presented your petition. If it is uh, you are going to make inquiries, you have not even gotten there. All you are doing now is preparation. Preparing the atmosphere to have time with God. Like Esther wanting to tell King Ahasuerus something. She had to organize a banquet. The banquet was a means to get the king's attention. That's all. Spent money, spent many things, wasted time, everything just to bring the king on the scene. When he comes, then one thing that you tell him is that the lover is also in the realm of alignment. The lover is also in the realm of alignment. And the lover is when you are dealing with things which can hinder your prayer. So you see that it's not just about praying. There are things which can hinder prayer. It can make nonsense of the time that you, all the time you spend there. Those things can make nonsense of them. So the lover is, you get to that place where you are dealing with those things. You allow God to deal with those things. One of them is iniquity. Psalm 66 verse 18. It says, if there is iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you. Your prayer. See, that's why resolving spiritual conflicts is a very powerful tool. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So iniquity must be dealt with. Must be dealt with. And you need to revisit that book. I'm telling you that you, when you go for retreat, not even retreat. I mean, go through the book and read and know all. Because you see that I'm mentioning many things, but I don't have time to go into them. For iniquity, for instance, I've talked about iniquity. I've spent time to write about it in the book. You can just get it and then just go through. Understand what iniquity is. You know, uh, iniquity, uh, transgression, trespasses. These things are, all these things are different. Idols in your heart. One of the most dangerous things is to have idols in your heart and go and inquire of the Lord. You will always have wrong answers. See, there's a prayer that uh, we must pray. In, in praying that you come into alignment with God, you must also pray that God will deliver you from yourself and from your selfish desire. Because if you have selfish desire, you will not be able to have the right, correct answer from God. Because you know something, God can even answer you according to the idols in your heart. So, in Ezekiel 14, verse 4, uh, God told them, He said that, I'm going to answer them 
according to the multitude of idols in their hearts. Ezekiel 14 verse 4. Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Every one of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and comes to the prophet, prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols. So, it's possible. Do you know that Balaam was given permission by God to go and curse the Israelites? Do you know that? Or you don't know? Oh, you don't know. You don't, you don't want to know. Balaam was actually giving permission. The first instance, God said, no, don't go. They are blessed. You can't curse them. Then, greater riches were offered. The price, the price was increased. Then Balaam said, because of the, what I'm seeing, wheat, let me hear what else God will say. Then he went again. Then God said, Go, but only be sure to do what I will command you. Then he said, Yes, sir. Then he went. As he was going, then God sent an angel to go and kill him. The angel was standing right in the way. That if this is the way, the angel came to stand right in the way, and still Balaam did not see. I mean, God, God tried to stop him, literally, but he didn't see. Because of the idols in his heart. Then, and that idol was covetousness, money. Hmm. One of the most dangerous things is covetousness. When it enters your heart, everything will change about you. The desire to, to make money through wrong means. Then, the angel came and stood at a corner where the donkey could neither turn left nor right, and it squatted. That was what saved Balaam. That was the mercy of God. But then he went anyway, and then he blessed them instead of cursing them. <laughs> but later on, when they entered the promised land, they killed him. So idols, then unforgiveness, bitterness, all these things will hinder prayer. So, this time you want to spend special moments with God, your heart must come into alignment. You must allow God to deal with all these issues. Otherwise, your prayer is going nowhere. Believe you me. 1 Peter 3, uh, verse 7. I hope I got it right. So I didn't. Verse, put verse 7 there. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Okay. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, that's wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Weaker vessel does not mean weak. It means fragile, precious, to be handled with care. That your prayers may not be hindered. So, bitterness can hinder prayers. How you get to it? So when he says, come bold, it doesn't mean that nothing can hinder you. If you have bitterness, your prayers can be hindered. In fact, Jesus Christ said it uh, in a very clear way. Matthew 5, 23, he even said that before you come to the altar and offer your gift, if you remember that somebody has something, you have done something against somebody, go, reconcile, and then come and offer your gift. Because otherwise, the gift you are offering is nothing. You will not, it will not be accepted. Do you know that Cain's offering was rejected? His offering was rejected. And God rejected Cain and his offering. Not only his offering, he himself was rejected. See, so bitterness can hinder prayer. Mark eleven twenty four. he said that, uh, no, 25, 26. He said, when you stand praying, when you stand praying, if you remember, if you have anything against anyone, that one says, forgive him. Forgive. So this is the time that you, 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 you go through your heart, resolve all these issues. Because 
you are setting the ground for an encounter. You can set the ground for an encounter. You, are, you can set the stage for God to come. If it is a retreat that you are just going to build yourself in the Lord, you also need to go through this protocol. These are protocols you can't do. That's why resolving spiritual conflict has been designed to help you get into the mood. Then, evil conscience or motive. Evil conscience or motive. I think I will end with that because uh, there's a lot, but I can't finish. So, I'm I'm going to continue next week. But let me end with evil conscience or motive. And Bible says that with unveiled faces, if we behold the glory with unveiled faces, then we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Now, take note of the unveiled, unveiled face. It is only with an unveiled face that we can behold his glory. The face is not your literal face, your heart. Now, when you have evil motives and conscience, that's why retreats are very powerful. Because, you see, nobody can know your motives. Even sometimes, you can be deceived by your own self. When you go before God, and God begins to put his light on you, and God begins to tell you, now, this thing that you want to do is bad. This thing that you did, it was a good thing, but with a wrong motive. Your conscience, so you surrender your motives, your conscience to God, for God to purge, for God to clean, for God to assess. Hello? Do you know that God is a God who searches? He searches. He searches by two instruments, the Holy Spirit and your spirit. The Holy Spirit is a searcher, and your human spirit is also a searcher. So when you go before God, he takes your spirit, and then begins to search your, all the inward parts, inward parts, with your own spirit. And then the Holy Spirit too searches. The Bible says, examine yourself and see whether you are in the faith. Second Corinthians 13. It says, examine yourself and see, verse 18, and see whether you are in the faith. Examine yourself. And this is part of the protocol that you engage before you encounter God. Now, Acts 24, verse 16, Paul is talking about conscience, motive. Conscience, and they are very powerful. Very, very powerful. Very important. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? I said, test yourself. Examine yourself. You see, but the spiritual man judges himself. And he himself is not judged by anyone. That's First Corinthians 2.15. It said, but the spiritual man judges himself. That's what I'm talking about. He judges himself, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. He judges all things. When you go to First Corinthians 11, I think verse 13 or 31, he said that if we will judge ourselves, then he will not judge us with the world. If we will judge ourselves, we will not be judged. So this is a place where you will judge yourself. You allow God to throw his light on you for your motives, your conscience, everything to be paid. You will dedicate it to God. My conscience. And that, that's, you are still at the place of the love. You see that you have not even gotten to the place of activity. You are still in the alignment process. Alignment process. After that, then you go to the golden candles where now you are going to search all your systems. It's interesting. You search all your systems. The Holy Spirit will. And there are specific questions that you must ask yourself. I'll, I'll talk about that next week. Specific questions that you must ask yourself. Your Christian life. How you can assess your Christian life. Specific questions. Your uh, foundational system, your um, connecting system, informative system, deliverance system, what else? Um, ministry systems, dominion system, and what else? Um, informative system, seven system. And you, you will use the seven uh, candlesticks to do that. God will examine all the seven. These are the seven systems that the believer has. 
and when you go for retreat, all your systems should be serviced. By the time you come out, all your systems, all the questions, see spiritual health check. There's a health checklist. Health checklist. You know, I, this morning when I woke up, um, I had a WhatsApp message on a platform, and it was a video, and it was it was the video was spiritual health checklist. And I was, <laughs> I was just, you know, even though the video was talking about something different, you know, asking questions, certain questions. Um, how many suits have you won? Uh, uh, or what, what are the sins you've committed? Uh, are you sure the rapture counts today you will go? Or oh, some of the questions. But what I was interested in was that the health, che- the health checklist. So, we have not, we have not, now, I want you to, in your mind, I want you to know that we have not entered the holy place. We are still in the outer court. So, so next week, we'll enter the holy place. How you get TV? Okay. Let's, let's pray. Let's, let's be on our feet. Let's pray. And I, I don't even think I'll be able to finish next week because I've not even come to how to prepare for the retreat. Yes. How to even prepare. This one is what you do, but how to prepare for it and all the things you must do. I've not even come, come to it. So, and even after the retreat, what you should do. Let's begin to pray. Thank God. Praise His name. Thank Him for grace. Thank Him for His mercy. Pray for more grace, more, more strength the desire to seek him, the grace to seek him. Sometimes you know that there's no desire even to pray. You see that things are dry. It's time for a retreat. You see that your love walk with God is going down. Your appetite for spiritual things. You see, when you are sick, one of the first signs is loss of appetite. Anytime you lose appetite for spiritual things, you are sick. You are sick and you need to go for retreat. You need to turn aside. When you have lost spiritual appetite, appetite for the word of God, appetite for uh, spending time with God, appetite for the believers gathering, you have lost these things, it means you are sick. Because the loss of appetite is an indication that something has gone wrong. And you need to turn aside and go before God and ask him to fix you. Ask him to breathe on you. Ask him to touch you. I'm, I, when, I, when I talk about soaking retreat, you can just go on a retreat just to soak in the presence of God. Just to go and lie down there and allow God to breathe on you. Just to go and listen to worship songs and meditate and allow God to refresh you and come back. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let this culture be part of your life. Let it be part of you. You can have scheduled times for retreat. And then you can also have times where the Spirit is tagging you, prompting you, urging you for a, a time, a special time with you. That He needs you. He needs you. He wants, he wants, He wants to put something in your spirit. Then also a time where you see th- things happening that you don't understand. Say, if this is what is happening, then what is happening? What is, it, what is going on? Let me go and inquire. Let me go and seek the face. At t- times when you feel that, uh, let me turn aside and see why this bush is not being consumed, even though it's burning. And God will begin to speak to you. God will bring clarity of purpose. He will shed greater light on your path of destiny. There's no reason to be confused when you can go on a retreat. When you can spend time with God, when you can allow allow God to breathe on you, there's no need to burn out. There's no need to come to the end of the rope. 
There's no need to come to the end of the rope where you are frustrated, where you are thinking of taking your life. When you can go for your trip, you can go and pour your heart out before the Lord. You can just go and lie down and, and ask God, please touch me. You have genuine purpose. If I am a product, you created me and you have genuine purpose. Fix me, whatever is wrong. Fix my conscience. My motives are the idols in my heart, the iniquity in my heart. Fix me, fix me, fix me. We are praying this prayer. We are praying that that desire. You see, I say that uh, we are, we should not be people of special retreats. We should be daily seekers, daily seekers. It's not that our life should be reduced to special retreats with God. No, we might become daily seekers. Special times with God, they just come at uh, Kairos movements to take us to new thresholds and to new levels, and they just come to help us to see God more. But that is not that is not the order we saw it in this life. So we are praying for the grace of consistency. You see, intimacy with God is a daily affair. It, it doesn't take one day. It doesn't take one day to know God. It doesn't take one day to come to a certain level. It takes one day at a time. And it takes the discipline of consistency to maintain a consistent work with God every day. Seek Him every day. Desire to hear His voice every day. Desire to receive daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Desire to pick the manna every morning, every day. He said, who is man that you visit him every morning, every morning. He said, he awakens my ear, my ear to hear morning by morning, morning by morning. We are praying for the grace to be consistent in our relationship with God. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Kobahala, sitarabaha, manderebe, himatara makose. Kronta talabaha, le krodo zetelesh, vante krima tando sitaha, lo bradi krabalaus telehandes, vande broko si telehedes, vali brokosa. The grace to be consistent, the grace to be consistent in our Christian life, the discipline, the discipline of rising up to pray, the discipline of rising up to pray, doesn't matter how tired we are, the discipline of rising up to seek the face of God, not a religion, but discipline to maintain relationship, relationships have to be serviced, relationships must be serviced and it takes discipline to service relationships, it takes consistency, to service a relationship with God. Consistency. Consistency. Jesus Christ often withdrew himself. Jesus Christ often withdrew into the wilderness to pray. But Bible says it was his custom to pray every day. To seek the face of the Father. Every day. God came down every morning to have a chat with Adam and his wife. In the cool of the day. Every morning. Every morning. Consistent. Consistent. That is how we get to know God. That's how we get to grow in the Lord. That's how we get to develop our roots in the Lord. We get to build strong foundation. Strong, unshakable foundation. If we can be consistent in this one thing. That every day, every day I will seek his face. Every day I will seek his face. And on special moment that he calls me aside, I will turn aside and spend more time. Turn aside and inquire. Turn aside and be filled more. By this consistency. Thank you, Lord. Ko bahada, sita la bahalas. Mandere be ko zede, santa la ha. Rada katole moho, sita le besh. Onde bre katala ma, konde de bo sita lesh. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are praying this last prayer. We are praying for Ghana. We are praying for Ghana. We are releasing this prayer into the soul. The soul structure of this nation. Anything that has been programmed, you know, we had a prophecy, um, we had the, the word of God last Friday concerning what the enemy has planned. We've prayed against it and we are praying this prayer again. Anything that has been programmed, that is like a time bomb programmed into the earth of this nation to be released as uh, a time bomb, you know, according to timing. We are nullifying all those weapons. All those weapons that have been assigned to time and calendar. We are nullifying them. Anything that they have assigned to months, 
that in the month of April, in the month of July, in the month of August, we will do this. In the month of October, then we will do this. Then in November, we are canceling all those. You see, the, the, the devil does that. Haman, Haman, Haman appointed the 13th of the 12th month to annihilate the Jews. It was a calendar something. Are you getting me? And so the devil also does that. So we are blotting out all the various appointments. We are disappointing all the various spiritual appointments that they have engaged. Let's open our mouth and pray. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We come against every agenda of wickedness. Every agenda coming from the corridor of wickedness, corridor of hell, against Ghana, against our election, against our peace, against everything that God has planned for this nation. We are coming against it. We nullify all the dates. We make nonsense of all the programmings. Anything that has been programmed and tied to a date or a month, a day, an hour, a minute, a second, we disappoint all those devices. In the name of Jesus, we nullify them and we cancel them in Jesus' name. And we declare it will not stand. It will not prevail. In the name of Jesus, it will not stand. It will not prevail. In the name of Jesus, any weapon that has been, that has been labeled by a certain date, certain day, certain time to spring a surprise to be released into this nation, through the airways, through whatever means, we arrest those weapons and we negate them by divine authority. In the name of Jesus, people that have been prepared against a day, against a month, against an hour, against a minute to be released, to be released into this nation to cause mayhem. In the name of Jesus, we cancel all those appointments. We cancel them in Jesus' name. We arrest those people in the spirit. In the name of Jesus, we disconfigure their thinking. In Jesus' name, let their heads and their minds rebel against their bodies. May they not be able to think straight. In the name of Jesus, anytime they start devising evil, let them be confused. Let darkness engulf them. Let them not think straight. Let their senses and their reasoning powers be interrupted and be arrested. In the name of Jesus, a people that have been shadowed to speak and to bring about the intentions of the, of, of the kingdom of hell, we arrest them. We arrest their tongues. We condemn their speech. In the name of Jesus, he says, any tongue that rises against us, we shall condemn in judgment. We judge those words and we condemn them and we remove them from the scene. Let darkness absorb all those words. In the name of Jesus. Demonic agents and entities in influential positions that will seek to perpetuate the agenda of heaven, the agenda of hell. In the name of Jesus, we arrest them. We arrest them. We tie their hands behind their back. In the name of Jesus. And we render them impotence. In Jesus' name, that they will not be able to carry out their devices. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We will not allow evil to rule in this nation. The church, we, the church has the authority, the authority to forbid and to permit. The, 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 the nation of Ghana, the destiny is not in the hands of politicians. They have civil authority. We have spiritual authority. And therefore, we can, we can control and we can manipulate things from behind the scenes. Whatever, whatever they decide to do that will be inimical to Christianity, we can issue counter orders and issue counter instructions. And we can arrest those things and truncate whatever process has been started. Let's pray this prayer again. Any agenda to promote LGBT, the meeting that they are planning to have, it will not happen. We, are, we disallow it. In the name of Jesus, lift up your voice and declare. In the name of Jesus, we disallow it. We disallow it. We disallow it. We are also bona fide citizens of this nation. And we have a say. 
And therefore, by reason of the authority we have, even as the church, the ecclesia, the senate of the kingdom, we issue counter legislation and counter instructions and we cause that program to be disrupted and to be destroyed. In the name of Jesus, we throw confusion on the planners. Those who are planning this program, we throw confusion on, in their camp. In the name of Jesus, we blind their eyes in Jesus' name and we cause their thinking to be messed up. In the name of Jesus, they will not be able to think straight to plan for this program. In Jesus' name. And we declare that it will not happen. It cannot happen. In the name of Jesus, as we have bound on earth, let it be bound in heaven. In the name of Jesus, he said, whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. In Jesus' name, as we've bound on earth, let it be bound in heaven. In the name of Jesus, let the banner of Christ be lifted high. In Jesus' name, we bring down any activity that is, that is designed to promote LGBT agenda in this nation. We bring down, not in our lifetime, in the name of Jesus, not in our lifetime. For as long as the church will speak, the church will speak, the, the tide of evil will be, will be stemmed. For as long as we keep our mouth shut, evil will rule. But when we speak, evil will be stemmed. When we speak, evil will be kept at bay. For darkness has, will, will cover the people and gross darkness. But it says the Lord will arise as light and shine in the darkness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you and we bless your name. We pray that your grace will be abundant towards us. Have mercy on Ghana. Let Ghana triumph and thrive. Let Ghana live. Let Ghana, the soul of this nation, respond to the call of destiny in the name of Jesus. We pray with us here. Amen. You may take your seats.